You've likely heard the expression, it's all Greek to me. Uh, People use that when they have no idea what's going on with a language or a saying. So when it comes to studying the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, it creates a bit of tension for people who have never had any training in the ancient languages. Well, do not fear the ancient languages. This episode is going to help you to better understand how to engage the Bible in its original languages, whether you've had training in Greek and Hebrew or you've had no training whatsoever. Whatsoever. This is going to be helpful to you here in part five of Lenses of Context. Hi, everyone. We are jumping back into our Lenses of Context mini series. We're doing this in conjunction with our free ebook. The number one mistake most everyone makes reading the Bible. If you haven't gotten your hands on this yet, the details are below the video. Uh, But we've been working through these six different lenses of context. And today we come to our linguistic lens, which just simply means the study of languages. So we're gonna be dealing with the original languages, translations, what did these words actually mean? And here's what's cool, is it's not just the definition of a word, One of the things that's interesting about language is that it inherently holds the values of a culture. And so that's always a facet that you wanna kinda keep in mind as you are looking at the original languages. Now, when we talk about original languages, we are acknowledging that the Bible wasn't originally written in English or Spanish or German. It's originally written in Hebrew and Greek primarily, and then we get a little bit of Aramaic in the book of Daniel. But our Old Testament is in Hebrew. All of our New Testament manuscripts have been found in Greek. And so we're dealing with Hebrew and Greek, which are very different than English. And as my good friend Lois Tverberg likes to say about Hebrew in particular, she writes this. Hebrew is a word-poor language. Biblical Hebrew includes only about 8,000 words, far fewer than the 400,000 or more we have in English. Paradoxically, the richness of Hebrew comes from its poverty. Because the ancient language has so few words, each one is like an overstuffed suitcase bulging with extra meanings that it must carry in order for the language to fully describe reality. I mean, what a great illustration that is, an overstuffed suitcase. And this is true of Hebrew, it's also true of Greek, um, but especially with Hebrew, that word poor language, if you will, of Hebrew uh, is even more than what Greek is. But Greek still carries a lot of meanings with each word. So when it comes to Looking at the Bible, we want to ask the question, what is the original language? And let me give you an example of just how significant this is and how like a Hebrew word can carry a host of meanings that feels like we're dealing with two ends of the spectrum. And we are. Uh, Let me show you an example from the book of Jonah. So Jonah has had his encounter with the fish. He's finally on his way to Nineveh. He has this message and an English, it's only eight words. In Hebrew, it's actually only five words. And so we read in Jonah 3, 4, that Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, talking about Nineveh here, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, when he uses this word overthrown, and by the way, just prior to this, God says, I'm going to give you a message to proclaim. This word overthrown in Hebrew is hafak. And yes, you have to be careful in saying that word. It means to overthrow or to transform. Uh, It can mean to overturn or to turn, meaning overturn in the sense that Nineveh will be destroyed or they will repent, which that the root of the word repent means to turn or to return in that they will be saved. And so when we come to Jonah's message, this is a very specific word that can go either direction. And we're like, we wonder which way it's going to turn because we don't know the Jonah story, or at least the first time we read it, we didn't know how the story was gonna end. And as we find to Jonah's great chagrin, 
they actually choose the latter and they're going to be, you know, turned and saved because they're going to repent. So that's just one example of that. Now, when it comes to many of us, we hear that and we go, well, that's really great, but I don't know how to figure out what is the Hebrew or Greek word and what it means. So how do I understand what is going on with really key Greek and Hebrew words? Well, there's several answers to that, but one in particular is, reading multiple translations. That whenever I study the biblical text, in addition to the original languages, I am reading English translations, multiple ones, in order to see how the translators are translating words. Because Greek and Hebrew carry so many meanings that they have to decide when it comes to translators, what's the best English word or English words that have to be used in order to capture the meaning of that Hebrew or Greek word being used. And so one of the ways in which you can do that is by reading multiple translations and just taking notice of how things have been translated differently. Because if you see one word in particular that's translated very differently among the different translations, then you will know, oh, there must be things going on or more going on with this particular word that you want to take notice of. And this is why, by the way, we have so many different translations because every translation is an interpretation, meaning that how a translator is looking at a word and the greater context and what they think the best English equivalent would be to that Hebrew or Greek is then used. And because you know Hebrew and Greek carry so many meanings with each of the words that different translators are translating it a little bit differently. Now, they're always very similar and it's not fundamentally changing the meaning, but it's important to know that every translation is an interpretation from those translators who are working from the Hebrew and Greek and putting that into English. Um, and so when it comes to translations, it's always important to know which translations am I drawing upon and what was the purpose of that particular translation. So uh, when it comes to types of Bible translations, you have literal, dynamic, and paraphrase are kind of the three groupings that you get. And literal is that word for word. Uh, the dynamic is thought for thought and paraphrase is idea for idea. So when it comes to looking at English translations, at least for me, my favorite English translation to study with is the New American Standard Bible. And that's because it is among the most literal translations you can get your hands on that's readable as far as English and it doesn't feel too crazy wooden because some you know, feel really, really wooden. That's the language people will use. And other times when you read the English, you go, oh, this thing is just flowing. Yeah, it's probably because it's further down the spectrum, which is good, but just understand that a translation that we often use here at Walking the Text is the NIV. Well, that is a thought for thought. Uh, and sometimes we're using the NASB, sometimes we're using the ESV. I also like the NRSV, and all of these are listed in the ebook, all right? So the main ones that I use, but it's just helpful to know there are different types of Bible translations and the translators are approaching it either from a literal, dynamic, or paraphrase perspective and that impacts the translation that you are reading. Now, one of the, the best resources that is out there to help you to understand what's going on with the original languages without you necessarily knowing what the original languages are is what is known as the Net Bible. So the New English Translation Bible. And this full notes edition is what you wanna get your hands on. Now, you can get this in both um, book form, physical book form, or in digital form. And that digital form you can get at netbible.org. And when you come into the digital platform online at netbible.org, you can choose, of course, any passage from the Bible, and you have a host of different translations that you can pull from. And this one, this Net 2, is talking about the second edition, which correlates with over 60 
thousand translator notes to help you understand what's going on with a given passage. So, for example, we have it open here to Matthew chapter 5, and in verse 4 at the end, there is this 8. And if you click on that 8, the 8 shows up over here in all the notes that follow. And there is a study note here. There is a translation note. There is a text critical note, meaning here are ways in which this could also be translated. And all of these notes help you to understand what's going on in that particular text. But it also goes one step further because you can choose the notes form, or since we're dealing with the New Testament here, you can choose the Greek. And if you choose the Greek and you highlight this word comforted, it will highlight it in the Greek. And if you click on the Greek, it will bring up a box that will help you to understand how this word is working in the original language. And so it'll feel much more accessible to you. And then for those of you who understand the Strong's Concordance, there is a number there to do concordance work on that particular word. And so just a really great asset to help you to understand the original languages, even if you've had no training whatsoever in the original languages. Uh, and again, you can get this in digital form or you can get it in book form. I like physical books. And so um, this is how a typical page looks. This is the biblical text here. And then these are all of the translator notes. So there's so much going on to help you to understand this from a linguistic perspective. Uh, additionally, you can garner a lot of this information in a really great reference Bible or study Bible. There will be footnotes that will mention different things or in a reference Bible like the New American Standard Bible 2020 version is that you have the text you know, in two columns here, and then you have like translator notes down here, but then you also have all of these passages that are referencing a similar passage. So it's not just understanding what word is being used, but what are some other passages that are using the same language, the same ideas, and this will take you to those places, and also a great study Bible will do that as well. But in addition to just these really great resources, here is how you can grow in your linguistic abilities, even aside from the original languages, is just paying attention to what you're reading. So paying attention to repetition. What words are being repeated? What phrases are being repeated? And just taking note of that and asking, well, where else is this showing up? So, for example, you come to Genesis, and in chapter 1, we hear God is creating the world, and the word that we hear repeated is, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then you come to Genesis 2.18, then the Lord said, it is not good. For the man to be alone, I will make him a helper suitable for him. And so because we've heard it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, when we hear it is not good, it's like slam on the brakes, slow down and try to figure out what's going on because this is prior to Genesis 3. Sin has not entered the created order. Everything has been good, but even within the goodness of God's creation, God says it is not good for the man to be alone. Like we're called to be in relationship with God. There's a vertical side, but there's also a horizontal that we need human companionship. What's more is this is on the heels of God giving Adam the instructions for taking the garden somewhere to work the land. And so now God is saying, but you are not designed to go it alone. And so this helps us to go. I need to pause and think through the implications of this. Uh, another concept here is what we call the principle of first use. That when something shows up, one of the questions we want to ask is, well, where does this first show up in the Bible? Because it often provides greater clarity on what that keyword or phrase is trying to communicate. So when it comes to Exodus 18, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes to the Israelite community and sees that Moses is being weighed down by this task of listening to all of the problems in the community and providing answers. Notice what Jethro's response is. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is 
not good. There we go. Principle of first use would take us all the way back to Genesis 2.18 and we go, oh, like he is not designed to do this alone. The work is too much that he needs to share that with someone else. And so it goes on, you and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. And so this is explaining it, but also going back to Genesis 2.18, principle of first use, and it's just paying attention to key words and phrases. Uh, And then again, it's just the repetition of key words and phrases. So notice this one from John 18.18, and I'm using the NASB here because not every translation has the clarity of this language being used here. But it says, now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. So this is the scene leading up to Peter denying Jesus. And we have this interesting detail, a charcoal fire. And as you're reading John, you just go, okay, that's that's an interesting detail. I just need to kind of file that away because once you continue your reading of John and you come to chapter 21, you come to this. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. And the charcoal fire is showing up again. And you go, what's the context here? It's the disciples after the resurrection do not understand what is going on. They go back to Galilee. They're out fishing. Jesus shows up on the shore early in the morning, calls out to them. Peter figures out it is Jesus, jumps off the boat, swims through the water, comes ashore. And what he recognizes is that there's a charcoal fire. Friends, a charcoal fire only shows up twice in the entire biblical narrative. At the point in which Peter is denying Jesus, Jesus and at the point where Jesus is going to restore Peter and address to Peter that he has been forgiven for denying Jesus around a charcoal fire and to bring it back to that moment, Jesus brings out a charcoal fire. It's spectacular. And just paying attention to that will help you to see more what's going on in that given moment. So in addition just to the questions that we've been asking, some key questions to ask of the text from a linguistic perspective. Uh, What words appear to be significant? Okay, pay attention to those repeated words because if something is repeated, take notice. Um, How do other translations translate it, right? So if you're holding up multiple translations or if you have the capacity and we offer several resources in the ebook that you can consult that will help you to figure out what the word means in its original language. Another question here, is the word communicating anything, visual or a cultural value? I mentioned at the top of the episode that cultural values are buried in the ancient languages. And you have this visual because Greek and Hebrew have a lot of word pictures associated with them. So are there any word pictures that go along with that particular word that you're looking at? And where else is it used in this particular book of the Bible? So if an author is using a word, they're probably going to use it multiple times. How is it being used within that book that you are studying or looking at? And then where else is it used in the Bible? You know, so you're kind of going, you know, here's where it's at, here's within the book, and then how is it just being used elsewhere in the Bible? And all of that gives you greater context and understanding to better know what's going on with that particular word. So I know when it comes to linguistic that it can be overwhelming, that for many of us, we've not had studies in the original languages and you're just kind of like, I'm just gonna leave someone else to do this for me. No, you can do this. You can start to figure out what is going on there. There are fantastic resources that are out there. And one of the things that we're doing here at Walking the Text is providing stories and bringing out Greek and Hebrew to give you a head start on certain things and certain parts of your study but the linguistic lens is important and it's something that we can all engage in at varying levels, sure, but we can all engage in it. So friends, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life.